I would like to make a short presentation on the subject set for this afternoon, and that is peace for the planet. It's an old adage that unless we have peace within, we cannot have peace without. It has been said so many times that some people forget it because we repeat a thing so often it loses significance. Just like we breathe the air all the time, we forget. We need to breathe just to live. So some of these things are taken for granted and we take for granted that peace must be there within, so let's fight for peace for the planet. The truth is, we have sometimes committed more violence and destroyed peace more effectively on the planet in trying to ensure peace on the planet than if then we would have done if we had just tried to have peace within ourselves. When we want to enforce an idea by violence, it is not peaceful anymore. It surprises me sometimes to read accounts of several wars that take place on our planet and have taken place for several centuries. And if you look at the point of view of one party, the other side is the aggressor, the destroyer of peace, and the one that is fighting that aggressor is fighting for peace. It really surprised me that most of the wars that have been fought were fought for peace. That we indulged in great violence and killing of human beings so that we can have peace. And we still believe in the theory that violence is needed to have peace. Looks like a very clear contradiction to me. That if we want to enforce peace by violence, then violence will rebound and each side will say, I am trying to protect peace. It's just like people have killed each other to propagate love. People have killed each other in the name of God. In the name of peace and God and religion, they've killed each other. And sometimes we want to protect the stones, we want to protect the bricks that we have made and we have put together and in the process of protecting our stones and bricks, we don't care if we kill thousands of human beings created not by us, but by the Lord in whose name we want to protect those bricks and those stones. It has happened over and over again in history that people have said, this is the house of God, we want to protect it. This is a personal freedom we want to protect. And to defend those material things, we keep on destroying the best temples and the best house of God that was ever made, which were the human being. We have failed to recognize that the human being is the perfect temple of the living God. There is no other temple, no other church, no mosque, no house of God so perfect as the one that we carry with us. And in the name of that God, we destroy these perfect temples of God. And yet we say, we are doing it in the name of peace. That the ultimate object is peace. How can destruction lead to peace? How can enforced love through violence lead to love? So these are contradictions we are living with all the time. The reason for this contradiction is very simple, but we don't pause to look at that reason. The reason is that we are trying to achieve something with our minds, with our analytical faculties with our rationality and not with our spirit and not with our love and not with our soul. Every time we have tried to enforce peace and love through the mind, we have broken peace and broken homes, broken people and killed them. It is in the very nature of these two, the mind and the soul. People may not recognize it today, they will recognize it tomorrow. That there is a big difference between the mind in a human being and the soul in a human being. The mind provides the thinking, the analysis, the pulling apart, the trying to understand that part is the mind and what puts it together and creates synthesis and love and total understanding and intuition and beauty is the spirit, the soul, and they are not the same. That the motive force for all consciousness comes from the soul. Even the mind cannot survive. It draws upon the consciousness of the soul and then starts splitting it by analysis. The mind has never been able to gain any knowledge except by analysis. 
Analysis means breaking apart. The mind has never used synthesis as a method of gaining knowledge. Therefore, to get peace is not a mental exercise at all. Whoever has tried to use rationality and mind and analysis to achieve peace has failed. That's why we failed again and again. Every century we failed. We are failing now too. We are failing everywhere where we are trying to use human analysis, rationality, great thinking, great sharing of thoughts. We've never been able to achieve peace. Peace has come when we have put this analysis aside, synthesized, come to our ultimate inner spiritual feeling, the feeling of the gut knowledge that comes through, an intuition that is spiritual, not made up, not thought out, not the kind of intuition where you have to wait, let me wait for my intuition and inspiration, ah, there it comes, not that kind, that is all mental, the one that comes spontaneously, the one that we tend to destroy by analysis, it is this shift that we have to make. The point I was making was that so long as we use a conscious faculty called mind and intellect, we cannot get world peace. We cannot bring peace to the planet. It's as simple as that. People will react to this because our educational process, our process of civilizing ourselves tends to sharpen the mind, tends to make the analytical faculty acute, tends to improve those parts of our consciousness which can analyze better. And that is the very root cause of violence and war upon this planet. There is no way the mind can find the solution to a problem except by analysis. Analysis by definition means breaking apart and looking at different pieces separately. You give one piece and you want to analyze it, by definition it means you break it apart, look at it part by part. The opposite of it, synthesis, Given the parts, you put them together, is not taught. I don't know any universities today giving importance to the method of synthesis for acquiring knowledge, for sharing with people, and for leading communities and countries and nationalities. I have not seen that. If this change could be made, people would be automatically using the intuitive process. They would use the spiritual process. They would use that part of their consciousness which automatically radiates love and peace. And when you come across people who radiate love and peace, you put them amongst a bunch of warmongers, the warmongers start wondering what's going on. They can't war anymore. I have seen that happen on a small scale again and again. You take people who are fighting and bring one man of peace, an enlightened man, who doesn't rely upon his mind but relies upon his love, intuition, and that synthesis which we call God consciousness, which we call enlightenment. You bring one such person, it's very difficult for people to fight. If he goes away to the washroom, we start fighting again, till he comes back. What's wrong? Why do we relapse so quickly? Because we have trained our minds. We never trained our spirits. Maybe one reason was that the pursuit of learning through methods of training itself was a mental activity. That the training itself, learning through training itself is a mental activity. Therefore, when we followed a mental method, we could not help but train the mind and bring it up to the present level. The planet is afflicted by our intellectualism. The planet is afflicted today by so much thinking that except for thinking, we seem to have no other conscious tool to deal with problems. Whenever there's a problem, we say, think about it. As if there's nothing else we can do. So we are brought up and trained, and this has afflicted. Like we have different kind of viruses that afflict the living organism, the living like a human being. This excessive thinking is a virus upon this planet. And yet nobody has said, that you can stop thinking and do something else. I want to put it to you very bluntly. Have you not seen that when you are sure about a thing just by direct knowledge, just by knowing, just by intuition, just by gut feeling, you know a thing and you start thinking about it, you get doubts about it. You don't uh, feel like that. Try it. Be sure of something and then think hard about it. And after a while you say, I'm not so sure now. 
It is the very nature of thinking, the very nature of the intellectual analytical process to bring about doubt. And with doubt comes the real creator of violence, and that is fear. If we had no doubt, we will have no fear. When we have doubt, we have fear. And fear leads to violence. Fear leads to a strange feeling of having to protect ourselves, to preserve, to preserve the physical existence, to preserve the value, to preserve an idea, to preserve something that we think is worth preserving, and we fight. We want to destroy before we can be attacked. We want to take the threat away. And we use violence to take the threat of violence away. So we introduce the very thing that we are trying to avoid. And this is what is afflicting the planet today. How can we bring peace upon this planet? From what I have said earlier, it would look, we should start institutions, have leadership that places emphasis on the synthesis, the unity, the love, the intuition, the beauty of togetherness, rather than the necessity of dissecting and analyzing. Have such leaders ever come on this earth? Yes, they come again and again. Such leaders, we call them masters. Perfect masters. Perfect living masters because they came in human form. Not merely as spirits guiding us within our heads, but as human beings who walked in our midst and talked to us with that very intuition, synthesis, love, togetherness that we are today seeking. They came again and again. They come even today. When we are more violent than usual, they come in greater numbers, in more places upon this planet. All we need to do really is to listen to them. But we want to put them in a category unqualified to deal with the problems of the planet. The problems should be left to political leadership. The problems should be left to economic leadership. The leadership that has been able to de develop political values and been able to create affluence and create a good creature life for us. It doesn't matter if it has led to some violence. We can put up with that, but we can't give up our creature comforts and we cannot give up, give up our great crusade for values which are based upon our mental thinking. What do we do with those people? They came and said, love is of utmost importance. Peace is of great importance. Love and peace are spiritual qualities. Love and peace are inbred in us. If we look at our own soul, we are personified love and peace. We don't have to learn love and peace. We are love and peace. The mind is not love and peace. Don't follow the mind. Follow yourself. You will have peace upon this planet. We didn't even try to look at ourselves. We thought about what they said. said ah, that's good philosophy. That's good religion. They put them, locked them up in theology, in religion, in philosophy, and say, let's get, get back to the real world of politics and economics. And they were there. Their messages were there. They have stayed with us more and more. We put them aside. If somebody comes up now and says, look, the future lies in that kind of leadership, they say, there is a conspiracy going on. Remember that book, the Aquarian Conspiracy? These are the conspirators who, in the name of God, religion, this, are going to take over the planet. Be cautious. They are going to take over the planet. Keep them in their proper place. Put them in the church. Put them in the closet. In the cloister. Anywhere else except in the leadership of the educational process, of the political process, where they may affect people and people may start loving each other instead of fighting each other. But the truth is, if we follow these spiritual leaders, these perfect living masters. If we just listen to them, if we are merely around them, the world will be a better place to live in. The hope for peace and love on this planet lies with these people. And even a few of them are good enough. We don't need too many. A few of them can do great. If we listen to them, we who are in a position to affect others, if we listen to them, we can affect a lot more. Some of you might have heard of one of the great classics of Indian religious literature called the Gita. The Gita is a great book. It is a dialogue between Krishna, who is worshipped as an incarnation of Vishnu, one of the three gods, and 
one of his disciples, admirers, Arjun, who was a prince, a ruling prince. And there was a war going on between two families. And Arjun was one of the families. And he had hired Krishna, who was a, who was a keeper of cows, he used to keep the cows. He hired him as his chariot driver, almost like a chauffeur. If you were to say in the present context, there was a king in his limousine and his chauffeur was his spiritual mentor. When they go to war, in the middle, both the armies are standing side by side and Krishna stops the vehicle in the middle and he addresses Arjun and he says, look what's happening. He tells him the responsibility of fighting and yet not getting attached to this fight. He gives lessons on the importance of yoga, of union, of oneness in the midst of the battle. And Arjun says, how can I fight the battle and also have yoga? He says, duty is separate from your consciousness. You must raise your consciousness through the three yogas. The yoga of action. Rightful action without regard to its result. You do what is best and don't care what happens after that. With detachment. If you can perform action with detachment, it is like yoga. He said the second class is the Gyan Yoga or Yoga Sankhya Yoga, the yoga of knowledge. If you contemplate and find out what's going on, you will find there is a limitation upon intellectual knowledge. And your giving up of intellectual knowledge by seeing its limitation is also yoga. He said third is the Bhakti Yoga, the yoga of love and devotion, which is superior to these and leads to the result of oneness and love. I mean, all this great discourse was going on amongst the gunfire on both sides. Arjun asked a very pertinent question. He says, Krishna, you are such a good speaker, such a great orator, and such a big discourse you are giving to me, and I am only one sitting in the audience. I should gather 10,000 people to listen to you. Why have you chosen to give such an important message just to one person? And Krishna says, it doesn't matter how many people listen to me. The important thing is, who is listening to me? When I find Arjun, the prince, to whom everybody listens, he is listening to me. The top intellectual of the time, if he can listen to me and I can explain to him, it is as good as having explained to the rest. Point I'm making is, it's not important who talks to whom. It is important that the one who listens is in a position to change the views of society. It is the view makers, the makers of views of society as a whole, who should listen to these people, whom we call perfect living masters. If this can happen, the planet will change. If the whole planet doesn't change, a substantial part can change. Right now, I put on the television, and there's war here, so many are executed there, so many are killed there, as if nature also plays the joke and keeps on destroying along with the man-made destruction that is going on. It's a strange thing that on all sides of this planet there is uh, um, violence, war, destruction, hatred. And many of them, if you listen to their own radio stations or own television stations, are doing it in the name of peace, in the name of God, in the name of securing everlasting peace. They are perpetrating violence. And all over, I hear very few news. If you hear a 30-minute bulletin, 20 minutes is taken up by violence, the rest by commercials. <laughs> by better soap. The point is, we cannot keep on going like this and yet pretend hypocritically that we are working for peace on this planet. Time has come when we should call this bluff off. Say, if you want peace, look to the men of peace. Look at the persons whose very personality was peace in whose association peace comes automatically to us. When we associate with them, love and peace overflow. We forget things. If somebody calls you away, look, you've forgotten you are supposed to fight. Hold it. I'll come back and fight. Right now, let me enjoy this atmosphere of peace that I've got. And we have this right now in different places. We have this happening right now on this planet. And we just put them aside. If this is not important. Let's get back to the real world real world will be in turmoil unless we get these people back into a position where they influence those who make the views of society. And then there can be 
peace upon this planet. The biggest message these people give to us in order to become peaceful within ourselves is don't be used by your minds. Use the mind, but don't be used by the, by the mind. Like the old genie, genie story. Now you all heard that, so I won't repeat it. Anybody who didn't hear? Aladdin? Okay, then I'll tell you. The rest can close their ears. Once upon a time, there was a young lad, and his name was Al Aladdin. How do you pronounce it, Aladdin? Of course, in the vernacular, we called it Aladdin in the local language. Aladdin was a young lad, and he found a nice lamp, and when he rubbed the lamp, a big genie appeared. And the genie was so frightening, so big, that Aladdin was scared. But the genie said, I am your slave. Command what I shall do. And Aladdin didn't know what command to give to such a powerful genie. He said, go and make a nice house outside and don't come back to see me till the house is complete. He wanted to get rid of that genie. So genie went out. Within a few minutes, he was back. The house is ready. Command what I shall do. This is a very efficient genie. He takes no time. You make a long bridge across the sea. Don't come back till you have done it. The genie went out. In a few minutes, he was back. The bridge is ready. Command what I shall do. To cut the long story short, Aladdin went out of commands very quickly. The genie was so fast. So Aladdin said, do what you like. And the genie said, all right, let's go out now. And now we'll do this and do that. So instead of Aladdin, the master, giving instructions to the genie what to do, the genie began to give orders to the master, who was Aladdin, and made him do things the way he liked. If genie is our mind, and we are supposed to use the mind and give it commands what to do, have we not reached the state of Aladdin, that the mind tells us what to do all the time? And taking us for a ride all the time? What happened in the story? What happened in the story can happen in our lives too. One day, a friend of Aladdin saw that this young, happy-go-lucky fellow who used to be so cheerful is now so sad, running around, has no time. So he stopped him one day and said, Aladdin, what's wrong with you? You used to be so happy-go-lucky. He said, I have found a strange kind of a slave, a genie who is so powerful, so quick, so efficient, that I have run out of commands and he keeps on telling me what to do. So I have become a slave of the slave. So I am in a very bad state. So this friend of his, who was a real good friend, he had some association with the spiritual tradition. Maybe he spent some time with the perfect living master. He told this friend, Aladdin, he says, look, I'll give you a way out. Next time the genie says, command what I shall do, don't tell him do what you like. Tell him to bring a big wooden pole from the forest. Bring a pole inside the house. When he brings the pole and says, what shall I do next? Tell the Genie, dig this pole in the center of this room. And when he says, next, what shall I do? Tell him, now go up and down this pole and keep doing it till I give you the next command. Keep him on the pole. When you need him, tell him, Genie, get off the pole, do this. When you come back, get on the pole up and down. A method that has been successfully used by these masters is, if the mind is so powerful, and because of our desires and attachments is dragging us all over and not letting us sit in peace within our own self, why not dig a pole? The pole of mantra, of repetition, of words, repetition of words in your head. When the mind is not doing anything else and is trying to draw you here and there, why not put it in the room behind your eyes and say, now go up and down this pole. Keep on repeating the mantra. When you need it, take it off. Make it do work. When it's done its job, put it back on the pole. Say, now go up and down. Why can't we do it? Do we follow this? This is just one way. There are so many ways they suggest in which we can overcome these distractions created by the mind. But the mind is a powerful instrument. It is not a weak instrument. It is so powerful that when you use it, it's the most effective method of doing anything, of communicating of achieving, achieving goals, achieving anything, including the achievement of keeping the mind subdued. You can use it for that too. But if you start getting 
into a position where the mind can use you, then it's terrible. What has happened to the planet is that we have allowed the mind to use us. What needs to be done is we ought to use the mind for the purpose for which we want to use it. We want to have peace. We cannot be slaves to the mind. If we make the mind our slave, we can have peace upon this planet. If the mind is our slave, it will follow us wherever we go. Where do we want to go? Where should we go? We should go to our home. Let's go home. Who said that? E.T.? Home? Let's go home. But where is our home? Well, somebody says, my home is in such and such a dress in Rochester, somebody in Minneapolis, somebody. These are not our homes. These are temporary abodes of this body. And this body will die, there will be no home left here. Where is our true home? The real home. The true home, if we can find the direction to our true home, we will have, even on the journey toward the tree, a true home, we will have peace and love within ourselves and therefore automatically outside amongst others and therefore on the planet. The true home is within ourselves, not outside. This human body is the most beautiful thing ever created. If I look at the history of creation from the nebula up to the galaxies and up to the planets in the galaxies and up to inhabited earth planet, I am not familiar with any piece of creation that surpasses this. If anybody is, you can improve my knowledge. To the best of my knowledge, the most perfect thing ever created by the creator or by man or by anyone else, the most perfect and most beautiful thing ever created was the human being. The human body with all its accessories, the accessories, the main accessory are the senses and then there is the mind and then there is the resident who lives in the body. Some people say there are two residents, some say one, there is a question mark on that. Who resides in this body using the mind and the senses? In this body, some people say the spirit, the soul, the consciousness resides. That our real individual identity is permanent, immortal and consists of our soul that temporarily resides in this body. It can go reside anywhere else too. Probably has. That is the real resident who has come to take residence maybe for 30, 40 years, 50 years, 100 years, 200 years. I don't think anybody lives 200 years anymore or not yet. Either way we can say it. But say 100 years, 75, 76 to be on the average. This is a temporary period in which that consciousness takes residence and finds a well-appointed place, all systems going perfectly, billions of cells working together to make comfortable the residence of the spirit, so many antibodies working to prevent any invasion by other microorganisms, so many molecules functioning in certain ways, so many cells activated by the DNA and activated by genetic codes and genetic patterns working to make sure that what the spirit wants, it can find in this body. Such a beautiful body, all things going in such equilibrium and such perfection. We have not made even a single machine anywhere that can work with this clockwise precision and coordination. It's all happening in the human body. And then tied to it, conscious experiences, sensory experiences to be able to see to use an inert retina, inert optic nerve, inert brain piece of meat, and you put them together and consciousness spurs on vision, being able to see. Ears to hear, to have all five senses operating in this body. Just consciousness can make use of the body to have a sensory perception in depth. Two eyes, so we can say that's far, that's near. Two years, we can say there's a direction this way or that way. All these apertures on the body, making the whole world real and making it possible for us to experience it, what greater miracle could there be? And this miracle is further enhanced by making the resident of this body use the best computer ever made. 
we have not even matched any closely. In the 60s, when I came to study at Harvard and was taken as part of my field trip to NASA, NASA, to see their new computer, the new computer occupied a big space, almost half of this hall. And that new computer contained so much information that the director told me, this is the best we have done so far. It can now hold 10 million bits of information. 10 million. I said, wow. He said, why are you saying, wow? You are carrying on your head in much smaller space a computer that can carry 20 billion bits of information. Much more than this computer can carry. Since then, we have improved that computer. What that big computer could contain in half a room of this size can be contained in the palm of my hand today. 10 million is very easily held in a small handheld computer today. So they have made computers which can now really hold 20 billion bits of information. But when a computer has been made which holds 20 billion bits of information, they were also able to see all the neurons of the brain and reassess all the spaces. And that has been revised too. Now the number is 30 trillion bits of pieces. So we are way back. In fact, we have fallen behind in the ratio. Point I'm making is this little computer given to the resident is the most powerful. There is nothing like it. Its speed is amazing. It, it works. They thought it works at the, at the velocity of light, which is the same as the velocity of electricity, of electrons. But now they find it is not so because they can now take pictures of activities in the neurons. The neural pictures they can now take of the brain show when you think in a linear way how the lights flow. And you can see this particular neural pattern was taken for one thought. But when you have a hunch, an intuition, two or three patterns light up at once without any time space between them. How does it communicate? They got pictures taken. They have found that speed which we were assessing as a necessary speed for movement in the neural veins is not true. There is something happening to life that the life force is transmitting something which is manifest in the form of the electronic speed that we can watch. We have changed so much. Our knowledge of this computer has gone up and there is a resident sitting here who has access to this computer. Why not use it? There are sensory perceptions, beautiful new nerves, nervous systems, beautiful motor system, beautiful computer, excellent accessories available to this resident. The resident is not using. The resident is busy looking out of the windows. Who is gone? What has my neighbor done? <laughs> the resident, through attention, going through the nine apertures, is visiting every other home except its own. People are taking interest in everybody else's affair except their own. Their own affair is to go and see what is inside, to find the true home. They are not busy in that. They are busy in finding out. They are trying to throw buckets of water to quench the fires here and there. They are great fighters for peace. And inside their own homes, there is fire. Fire of desire, fire of hatred, fire of lust, fire of anger, burning like nobody's business. And they are the ones who are going out trying to quench the fire of other people. What? Hypocrisy. How long will this hypocrisy go on? And we say, here we are contributing to peace on the planet. We have no peace inside, trying to bring peace outside. We are not qualified. You have to have a qualification to be able to affect people. There was a master in India, well known, very simple man, but he had a great influence on children. People knew that. Children would love to flock to him. Maybe he got some coins or something he had, some toys he would give, some rattles or something. And children loved. They said, one day he's going to produce. Sometimes he put the birds made of clay and said, one day they'll fly and people would sit there watching when they'll fly. So he played games of all kinds. But children loved to listen to him. He had a magnetic power on them. Such a charisma over children that it was known that no child can say no to this fellow. So one mother wanted to take advantage of this sadhu and decided to bring her child who was taking too much candy, that this candy is affecting this child and he's getting acne and pimples and this child should stop taking these sweets. So she brought the child 
to this holy man and said, Master, my child is taking too much candy. Tell him not to take candy. Knowing that if he says, the child will stop taking candy. The master looked at the child, looked at the mother and said, come after a week. They went away. After a week, they came again. And the mother repeated the question. She said, you asked me to come after a week. Here we are. The holy man looked at the child and said, child, don't take candy. The child said, okay. And went and stopped taking candy. What surprised the mother was, what was that one week period given for? Why were they asked to come after a week? So out of curiosity, she went back to the holy man and said, if all you had to do was to tell the child, child, don't take candy, why couldn't you say a week earlier? He said, ma'am, I must tell you, a week earlier, I was taking candy myself. If I don't stop taking candy, how can my words have any effect on anybody else? How can hypocrisy be effective? How can a person who lives a different life have effect upon somebody else and say, you be like this? A person who lives a certain life, if he says nothing and we associate with that person, we become like him. It's not necessary to say so much is the effect of example. But we are no good examples of peace on the planet. With our anger, with our jealousies, with our envy, with our fight, with the rat race for supremacy, how can we be good examples for peace on the planet? These are things we have to bring within ourselves. If we take the right route and use the right equipment inside the human body, we can have peace within and thereby find the way for peace on the planet. I mentioned in the earlier part that there is a resident whom we call spirit or consciousness. But some people say there are two residents. Who is the other resident? For want of any other equation, they say that must be God. That God is also inside the same body and this is his temple and the seeker or the human being is also inside the same body. And they are sitting somewhere up in the head in a space behind the eyes very close to each other. So close that nothing could be closer. And yet it appears they don't talk to each other. They don't see each other. They have no communication. It's like a husband and wife living in the same house not knowing the other exists. Such close proximity in the same body, in the same head, and they don't speak to each other. What's going on? The protagonists of the single consciousness say, to our own self within can give a solution, can give an answer to this question. And the road to peace is going within and resolving that duality, that division, that separateness. Separateness is an illusion which can be overcome by going within and finding the unity. Once a person found out, he was in great search of God and he found that he was looking in the wrong direction. He went from place to place, he went from workshop to workshop, seminar to seminar, temple to temple, church to church, book to book, library to library, religious leader to religious leader, spiritual leader to spiritual leader, master to master. He went all over and he found he was in the wrong direction. The direction was to go within himself. At last, after getting tired of all these trips, he found out the real way was to go within. So he started going within. And when he said, when I meet God, I am going to have a real big bash at him. You made me go all over. You made me do all this. And I am going to teach you a lesson for treating me like this. You gave me so much suffering. Wait, now I know the real road. It is within. I am coming. I am coming. You gave so he went within. He went within with a vengeance. And as he went within, he got more and more ideas, intimations of the greatness of God. He was all powerful, all knowing. The more he went closer to God, the more he felt, when I see him, I am going to tell him this. When he reached home, he found he was God. He couldn't say a word. He couldn't criticize anybody. And then he came out and said, do you know what happened? You can't see God. People said, what are you talking? You are the one who are the greatest seeker of God. He said, that's what I found. If you seek God, by the time you find him, you are God. When you are man, you have man and God. When you are God, there is no man. There is only God. That the truth is the oneness 
and that is our true home and the rest is illusion we have lived in this illusion for so long if we go back to our own home merge with our own origin we find that we were made of peace and love so even a partial journey i am not suggesting that unless everybody reaches there there will be peace on this planet even a partial journey towards that goal towards our true home can bring about peace upon this planet we are very lucky extremely fortunate at this time and at all times on this planet there have been human beings walking in our midst who have talked to us about this peace about going within about finding the true way about the spiritual path about the ultimate about the link that connects us with the ultimate home they have told us they can teach us they can bring happiness to us just by being on the path we are very lucky that they are still around let's listen to them let's be around them let's get hold of them let's benefit from them and there will be peace on this planet i will be very happy to answer any questions on the presentation i have made or any other subject which i missed to mention today yes um i went to the last meditation from her to the last the last that i chose was going home and i worked with that and the next meditation was seeking the beloved and i went to the center of the the mind behind the eyes i was there and i started to get a headache and i thought what's happening what's going on and i put my focus and the center of consciousness in my heart and i was home and i just wanted to share that and my question is what do i do today would you say a few words about that link between the heart and the mind the heart is what i call intuition there are two words we use occasionally either you live with your head or heart head represents mind and heart represents intuition so i i talked about the same subject today thank you for sharing any other question or comment yes sir uh, it was seems like when you read history and you read enlightenment literature and you look at the people who are sort of the movers and shakers they seem to have very similar personalities very similar kind of ideas Shall we call them the somatic time metaphor? Uh, how much are we victim as people just to a certain type of aggressive-minded, engineering, scientific, competitive, athletic type mentality that you find in certain kinds of people, or is the problem throughout the whole spectrum of personality? The problem is all over. In some, it is more visible and comes outside, becomes more visible to others. In some, it hides more within. but the problem is all over any other question or answer yes sometimes they hide what's going on inside that's not uh, they can't hide too well they may hide and they may think they have hidden it but other people are affected by what is inside and they're not affected so much by what is the pleasantries outside that is true we need to be happy inside then we don't have to put up any particular behavior outside it automatically affects people any other question comment yes peter uh first of all i'd like to apologize for getting off the subject but there has been a lot of literature sort of circulating now uh, concerning conspiracy blind sorcery and things of that nature so i'd like to ask you uh because in Some of your earlier tapes that I've heard, you mentioned uh, having experienced uh, blind sorcery contact. Some of the literature says that there's a conspiracy going on within the government and the aliens. There are some that say that the blind sorcerers are angels from a higher civilization. Some say that uh, they're humanity. That if, that they are an advanced wave of humanity that is trying to help us and so I'm just wondering I'm a little confused about what is correct or what is wrong uh can you comment on anybody has seen flying saucers personally in this audience you did okay let's share one experience then I'll comment on that would you like to share well 
this happened many years ago when I was, uh, when I was about 30 years ago. I lived in South Dakota. And uh, at that time, we used to do quite a bit of hunting in the evening, at night time. And rabbits. We used to go out and hunt rabbits and cod. And we were out in such part of the state of South Dakota, near the Missouri River. And uh, this particular night, we had uh, about four people in the car. Bright moonlight, and the cloud was the cloud of the sky. And we were down in the low bottoms of the Missouri River. And uh, out in that area in South Dakota, there is maybe a home or a ranch every 10, 20, 30 miles. There's hardly any yard lights at all, but when we were in the bottom of the river bottom, we noticed on top of the hill, it looked like, at first it looked like a yard light. It was brighter than a yard light. But uh, when we came up out of the river bottom, uh, the yard light uh, was higher up in the sky. It looked like a bright light. Then it changed to color from white light to blue light. Then it changed to red light. We were approximately uh, 35 miles west of Oneida, which is north of Pierce, South Dakota. That's where I grew up. And uh, we started back east to Oneida. The light followed us. We never got closer, and that, the light didn't get further away from us. The uh, light enlarged almost to the size of the moon. We stopped the car and got out. It was a very crisp night. It was in the wintertime. It was probably uh, zero, no wind, extremely still. We did not hear any engines, motors, uh, airplane engines, helicopters, nothing. The light again stopped. It did not proceed to go forward or backwards or up or down. We got back in the car and proceeded east, or, yeah, east, and the light went with us. As we approached uh, the town of Oneida, this, this is probably close to 1 to 130 in the morning, the light went ahead and it was changed color of uh, green and blue. Then it would change to red. When it changed to blue or green, it would illuminate around the light itself. We didn't know if we were going crazy, if we were, no one had been drinking or anything like that. But it was very mystifying because not any of us had ever seen anything like this before. No sound. It was perfectly uh, quiet every time we stopped the car, which we did several times. The light would stay in a certain position, never go up or down. No sound. Then as we approached the town of Oneida, the light went past us, it was on to our right. Then it went over the town, it seemed like, then all of a sudden the thing was just right straight up. And just in a split second, it was gone and disappeared and everything went like And that was my personal experience. And there were several other sightings similar to that, even when I graduated from high school out there, uh, back in the late 50s. And uh, it's kind of a common thing to hear stories about that. Were reports the same night that you saw it? A lot of people that saw it? No. Your group was the only person that saw it here. We, uh, we told a few of our friends, and they kind of snickered. <laughs> and uh, the idea, for many times, uh, the story that were told by other people that saw, saw similar things, they approached it with on the car. A lot of times they would light. They get within a certain distance, the car light would go out, the engine, the car into a dime, and uh, it seemed to be some type of magnetism or something that affected it. And there's a lot of other stories, but that was my own personal experience. Thank you. Sharing. Anybody else has any experience? This audience? Personal experience? No. Okay, I have met other people also, that's why I asked this, who have had personal experience. Apart from the books that we read and the stories, it's very easy, it's very good fantasy uh, also to make. A lot of uh, fantasies and other kind of, uh, what they call, uh, fiction, science fiction? Science fiction trends have come up to show this kind of thing happening. So, a lot of uh, science fiction literature has come up. But I am going by my own experience in childhood when I saw not only a light, but something that came down. And I thought it was a railroad track, lifted up, it was above the tracks. I thought it was one of the cars of the track. 
off the track. And I saw beings in that, and they went away. Then I've compared notes with the, another person who in Flagstaff uh, actually personally saw a similar uh, vehicle come, land, and communicate with the farmer who lives there. And then take the farmer inside the, uh, the vehicle, show him around, and through uh, recorded, like tape-recorded versions on discs, they repeated what some human beings had recorded there. So obviously they did not speak the language, they did not have that sound, but they used human sounds to communicate, and they communicated that you will, in 20 or 30 years, find out how we do it. But I don't know where, whether we're going to find out. It's about 20 years now. Maybe it's about, uh, yeah, it's about 20 years. Maybe in the next decade, some more knowledge may come. What they explained was that their vehicles come without any noise because there are no propelled engines at all. There are no turbines, no engines. They are using only the magnetic principle of creating an electromagnetic field. And they pick up the energy for the electromagnetic field from the existing gravity of the planets. So they don't uh, use uh, any other uh, power source except gravity of the planet which they are approaching. So what happens is, and they explain that to the lay farmer who is not a scientist. They explain that, that if water is falling, if water is falling down, why does it fall down? It's got tremendous energy. Why does it fall down? Because of gravity. It looks like the earth is pulling the water. That's why you have a waterfall. If you put a steel plate under that water and hold it still, the water that's falling in this direction goes in the opposite direction. Although the energy that is pushing it away is itself going towards the earth. So gravity, which pulls in one direction by a barricade, by an obstruction, can be switched to operate in the opposite direction. Or if you make an angle with the plate, you can move it in any direction you like. So what they said was they are using a very simple apparatus, looked like, looks like two or three washing machines put together in, in form, what that man farmer saw. They just three big boxes in that vehicle. And all they were doing was to create an electromagnetic field strong enough to act like a shield to gravity. That was the only new technology they had. And that shield was able to use, if they would loosen the power in that shield, then the vehicle would fall towards the ground by gravity. If they strengthened it, the same gravity was twisted around in the opposite direction and they would slow down because there was a pull on both sides. If they made it equal, it stood still. At any point on earth, they could make that vehicle stand still without any noise, without any engine at all. And then they could take it in one direction, put the whole pressure on one side and fly away, and get away. So this kind of uh, technology they explained to that farmer. But the question which you had asked is different. And I want to answer that question based upon not only our experiences we have just mentioned to you, but uh, the experience of a lot of people that this is pure speculation whether it's a higher form or a lower form. It's a judgment we are making. There is no reason whatsoever based upon the information we have to say it's a higher or lower. All we can say is different. It is different from what we are used to. Because they have evolved such a technology, we, are, we have a tendency to say it must be higher in intelligence because they've gone beyond our technology. But maybe they are fascinated by some of our pizzas. <laughs> and they say this must be higher civilization. G or Shaky must be the greatest scientist. <laughs> it's a matter of looking at things. So I would not say it is necessarily higher or lower I would say it is different. It is, there is so much evidence. In Badoda, on the west coast of India, uh, people have had several sightings. In the 70s, three, four sightings took place. There have been some problems with these sightings. One of the problems is what has just been reflected by a question Sam asked. How come when such a thing happens, everybody doesn't see it? Does it require a special vision to see it? Are we activated into a different kind of seeing to see it? There may be truth in that. If that is so, it is not a material object we are seeing. It's an object we can see, we can experience, but requires some kind of a kickoff of seeing different from what we are used to. Maybe that is their normal seeing of the people who are sitting in the, in the vehicle. 
But for us, it may not be normal. I have heard that things like this have happened, and many people saw. And I have also heard things like this happened. One person saw, he couldn't convince anybody. They all snickered, as you said. They still snicker. After all this, there are photographs taken by people. They say these can be made up. There is, uh, There are uh, very clear pictures. They say they are very easy photographic tricks. You give us a camera and some equipment, we'll make more copies for you. So therefore, the, the doubters, the doubting Thomases are always there to destroy any hypothesis we give about what is happening. All I said from my information gathering and my knowledge was that intelligent beings exist. That intelligence exists and intelligent beings exist, but not necessarily in the form in which we are expecting to meet them. And we will make contact with them because we are very close to it. These things have started happening. It means that we are not too far away. And we will understand more of the nature of their intelligence, the nature of their civilization, the nature of their priorities as we meet them. And they may be very different from our priorities. Till then, we don't make any excessive speculation. If we love these stories, we can read science fiction or make new movies. But, uh, uh, but we should wait for an encounter in which some of us can come and share that they decided to visit only this place. For example, this Flagstaff uh, uh, experience, they explained that there are only three or four spots on the earth where the magnetic distribution is so even that they can come and land easily. That other places, they cannot, they'll have a rough landing because although they are using gravity, but the gravity does not function so uniformly on every part of the planet. And therefore, it is only when we find such spots, which they feel that they are scanning all the time, that when we find such places that we land, incidentally, the places they mentioned to that farmer in the United States also covered Badola in the western part of India at that time. And which this happened much earlier. Badola came about 10 years later, 12 years later. So these are sightings which are recorded, and there is intelligence. The Hubble telescope had just been put aloft, you know that. And the director was one of the big scientists in astronomy today in this country. And he's considered a world uh, leader in astronomical studies. I heard him talk on the television the other day after Hubble was put in space in the, in the orbit. And they said, what do you expect to find? You just find clearer pictures of the same galaxies that you now see in a blurred way with the ground telescopes. What's the big idea of spending $1.5 billion just to take clear pictures? He said, no, that's not the idea. We may be startled by what we may see. They say, can you say something that can startle you as an astronomer? He says, yes. I don't know if anybody heard that interview. He said, the one thing that can startle me is already beginning to startle me is that all the theories that we know of creation, from nebula to galaxies to this, none of them fits in with the intelligent pattern in which they are operating. It's too intelligent to be an accident. You can have a big bang of any kind with any laws of nature, any laws of electronics, any laws of magnetism, any laws of gravity. They do not explain the placement of this creation the way it is. Maybe this Hubble telescope will give more clues on the intelligent placement of the elements of construction of this creation. But what I suspect, and that's the important point, is there is an intelligence operating there which may not be in the form in which we expect it here. We may not see the green Martians running this universe, but see intelligence in a totally different form. And that will startle me and startle others too. So the point is we are headed for an exploration to the beginning of time of this creation. 14.5, 15 billion years is the estimate, billion light years, is the estimated life of this universe as we know it. So if we are going to that part where the Big Bang created this part of the universe, the whole universe as we know it through telescopic means, we may get some answers to these questions and marvel what kind of beings are these that can exercise this intelligence and how do they operate? I can tell you, I used to tell people many years ago, this will be found, computers will be used for this purpose. I can tell you today that the energy forms which will be commonplace in the next century are not even known to us today. And they will be a clue, but they may come from the studies of intelligence that we find outside. One of the 
things. Now, I, I don't want to take credit that I am uh, coming out with some great prophetic information. I am just quoting great master, my teacher. I am quoting him because 50 years ago or more, he told me certain things, they all came out true in the last 50 years. I don't expect that the next 50 years will not come out true. Only on this basis, I am very confident that he thinks, he, he told me that we have not understood space as such. Space itself is a form of energy which can be harnessed. We have not yet done it, but we will do it. So the secret may lie in the very thing that we are calling emptiness. The secret may lie in the very thing we are calling distance. But we say distance from here to there may not be distance, but something else, a form of energy we have not yet discovered. This is just a clue, a hint. Watch out, Peter. Cass, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I'm not serious. We were talking about the uh, gravitational technology. What uh, seems to be a hook with the gravitational technology? The, uh, the, uh, the uh, equipment you're talking about. Could they have worked with you know, longer? Pretty close, because there's no limit. The acceleration they gain is when they come into the gravitational pull of any body that they visit. They can use, for example, they can travel immense distances because uh, they will come by the gravitational pull of the sun to the planetary system and then switch on and change direction with the same gravitational pull at immense speeds. There will be immense speeds when using the gravitational pull of the sun. And then they switch over, say, to Earth, knowing that we guys are sitting here. Otherwise, why should they come to Earth? They may go to some other planet. But they must have gone around and seen, there are some curious guys sitting here, let's go and make a visit there. So when they come here, they change the speed by using the available gravitational pull of the body as they approach it. So it's not the earth gravity that they will use all the journey. It's only the last part of the journey, maybe a few minutes of the journey. And then they can regulate it with that mechanism. The technology is so simple. In fact, uh, Cass, if you like, I can draw you up all the information. I got into details of that technology. So I'll draw up the plans and you and I will patent it. <laughs> and, and, and beat them on it. <laughs> yes. Sorry. No, it's a kind of plastic. It's a man-made material. More close to what would be like glass fiber or something. Some. It's a man-made fiber. It looks like that and functions like that. Very light. Yes, Bob? But what I'd like to know is with all the presentation about the uh, international conspiracy and the, the probability of our own government having such spaceships already here. Uh, what's the probability of this prediction that extraterrestrials, quote unquote, uh, would land to help take people off the Earth so they are provided when the whole cost is over, economic or whatever? Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, I hope that they are wiser than our politicians. Otherwise, they'll be used by our politicians. And any energy and any new technology they possess, our politicians will diplomatically deal with them and bring them and use their technology. If they are wiser in intelligence, they may not get caught in this local politics of the planet. The other uh, suggestion you are making, that would they be wise enough to take us away and bring us back? Well, they may attempt this to take us away, and we may not like to come back ourselves. They have a better place they may have. Uh, obviously, in the next century, with the technology now available, it will be possible for us to go into artificial satellites and live there. So it will not be necessary that we have to find a piece of land or a lot on the planet Earth to live. We can live outside and just visit and see, oh, these are the old ruins which we ourselves destroyed. We could be in that state. Yes? I suggested that uh, there's already copying on the moon. But that is top secret news for eyes only. Yeah, yeah. Not to be spoken here. <laughs> but, uh, oh, no, because it's for eyes only with you. <laughs> yes. As the creation appears on the outside, perhaps there's misoperation. Yes. Now, does that mean that the, is the creation an ongoing process on the inside? 
It's ongoing inside and ongoing outside. When we say inside, we are talking of the astral level of consciousness. If we go within at the astral level of consciousness, we open out into a sky which contains all the outside. So you can travel inside and find out what is evolving outside. It's in a constant change, both at the astral and in the physical plane. And you can study one from the other. If you travel it, travel a little faster than the change, you can overtake the change by speed. We have not found a vehicle yet and may not found, find for another 2,000 years on this planet or around it. We have come nowhere near in technology to find a vehicle to move faster than the speed of change which creates this universe. You know that the, the fastest moving things here are close to the velocity of light. But there are quasars at the edge whose movement suggests that they are moving at faster than the velocity of light, which we can understand. They say there must be an antimatter world there, which is giving signals like that. Otherwise, we can't explain anything moving faster than the velocity of light. But we have not yet found any technology to take a human, living, conscious organism, organism at a velocity even close to the velocity of light, not yet. And uh, it may take a long time, maybe a couple of thousand years before we evolve the technology. Therefore, in the physical plane, it will be a long, long time before you can overtake and see what hap is happening in the future. But you can go and see the past. In the inside plane, you can overtake it because you have a technology to go faster than the velocity of light. And therefore, you can see the future, what will happen. If you go there and see what's happening in the future, don't tell anyone else. They may get alarmed. Yes. Sam. If there are life forms other than human beings, would they necessarily then be part of the same God, the same oneness? Yes, because we have given that attribute by definition to God. The God we talk of is created by us. We were perfect living masters would be in touch with each other. That's right. That's right. They are in touch with them. If a vehicle approaches the light and it opens up some of the possibilities, you know, or it is the light because the effect of time, I don't know much about this, but the effect the time we have on a physical uh, entity and also given beings that are actually from other galaxies, isn't that, I mean, passing through time? Yeah. Now, I shift the scenario to, say, 3,000 years ahead. And I'm assuming that in 2,000 years, we'll find a technology to travel faster than the velocity of light. Just an assumption. It's not true. I'm just assuming for the sake of answering your question. In 2,000 years, we've found a technology to travel faster than the velocity of light. So we go out and we find other beings, intelligent beings. And we find that the spiritual perfect living masters who always existed always knew them. And they were shifting souls from one system to another all the time, even in the past 10,000 years. When we find that, what will we do? It will just be like finding a new world. If you do that first, you will be called Christopher Columbus. Oh. Or by whatever name is popular at that time. So the, the point is just a discovery. After that, it will be so normal. People will wonder, that was a primitive race that didn't know what existed. That we will be a very primitive race, we didn't know what existed. And flying from place to place was like... Intercontinental flights. Like we now move in jumbo jets and can go across the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean in a matter of a few hours. They will say it's so easy. These people had no technology. They were uh, primitive. And they never knew anything. So now it's common. People will make reservations and travel. So it will look very ordinary to them. It looks so strange to us. Yes? But you're telling us in Kentucky, you're telling us that uh, if we go with them, we can do this much faster. Sure. Not only faster, you can do it much sooner. Much faster, much sooner, much more efficiently. Much more efficiently. And without any uh, wear and tear. <laughs> that I can't say. <laughs> I, I think it would be, I think it would be great if instead of life form yes the whole attitude on existence will change 
the whole attitude on a race. Uh, you see, just like attitudes about nationalities change, uh, about countries change, the borders of countries they kept on changing. As we look at, look back at history, these national borders, the civic sense, patriotic sense, belonging to a particular part of an artificially drawn boundary and saying, I am American, I am an Indian. Uh, these have all come up by confinement to a planet and by trying to grab what we can. If we find there are many planets like that, our attitude to that will change. But then again, we'll try to grab planets. If the present attitude of the mind continues. Last question. Yes, Peter? There are, there are, there are, there are some uh, ideas in theosophical literature, which goes back to, the, I think, the ancient Vedas, that this creation is just the opposite of what we think it is, that it's like a photographic negative. What we consider space is actually solid. And what we consider matter within the space is bubbles within that solid matter. It, it, yeah, that's, yeah, that is uh, revealed in the Vedas itself, that we uh, misunderstand the nature of space, and that space is far more solid than we take it. And that uh, the space, but then it also means that space creates a level of experience. That means when we talk of the physical universe, see, it's very easy for us to talk of physical universe, we are all physical beings sitting here. The truth is, it is space in a certain form of expression that makes a physical universe. It's the same space in a slightly different form that makes the astral universe. So space is the secret. When we find out the nature of space, for example, we can break and destroy this wood even after creating it. But if we create space, we can't destroy it. It's so hard. It's so difficult to destroy. You can put any number of obstacles into it. It just strengthens it and makes it stronger. So it's the opposite of any kind of matter that we know. So in terms of its strength to, sub to subsist, space is the strongest matter known. So, But we haven't called space matter yet. One day we will. So then we will find the truth of what was said thousands of years earlier. But they were saying about the same thing. And when we will find out the truth, it won't look, oh boy, we found this after so many years. It looked like it's the same contemporary period. Because you will also note, uh, note at that time that what we call time itself is just the nature of space. So all views will change. When we find out the true nature of space, lot of views that we have today about matter and the way it operates and the electromagnetic forces that are controlling it, they will change with it. I hope uh, um, we'll get more and more information and uh, many of us are going to live through that and see. And some of us may pass on. We may see from another planet or from some other form. And for younger people who are going to go into the next century, in the next decade, in the 20, uh, 21st century, you have got good news to look forward to, new experiences, new technologies, new information. Try to make this place a peaceful place till then, so that you have the chance to see. Thank you very much.